My name is Randy Hoyt. Um, my day job, I'm a web developer, but on the side, I'm what I call a myth enthusiast. So today I'm going to share a little bit about that hobby. Art and story from traditional, um, from traditional cultures can inspire and inform our own creative work. Uh, they can also push us beyond the limits of our own experiences and challenge us to fulfill our full human potential. Totem poles are a great example of this with their stunning artwork that depict fascinating and compelling narratives. When you think of Native American culture, you probably think of teepees and totem poles. But most Native American tribes didn't have either of these. Totem poles were only carved by a small number of tribes, those living in the area marked in red here on the map, um, from southeastern Alaska, down the coast of British Columbia, as far south as Vancouver Island. We don't know how long the tribes in this region carved these poles. The tribes had no system of writing and left no records, and the poles themselves decompose and deteriorate. We do have a couple of sketches from explorers in the 1790s. This one shows an exterior entrance pole, and others show interior house poles. The evidence suggests that the art of column carving existed at least a few generations before contact with Russian and European explorers, but that contact brought radical changes to the art form. The fur trade introduced a huge amount of wealth in the region. The traders brought iron tools, which made the carvers more efficient and their designs more elaborate. The traders also brought diseases that caused tragic loss of life, leaving many leadership positions vacant. All these factors led to lavish displays of wealth, gift giving, and chiefly competitions for social rank that dramatically increased the number of poles commissioned. This led to what is known as the golden age of totem poles in the 1800s. Totem poles were carved of western red cedar. This is a beautiful soft wood, very durable, but also very workable. A uh, totem pole, the larger poles, could be 30 to 40 feet tall, um, sometimes even taller, and they'd have a diameter of about four feet. The poles would then stand outside for 50 to 60 years before they would collapse. I think I'm a little ahead. There we go. A pole could take as long as two years to carve. A, carver, or a patron would hire a carver from outside his own clan, preferably from another tribe altogether. Uh, the, patron, the carver would live with a patron for that entire process. The patron would spend a great deal of time communicating to the carver the histories and legends of his family. These carvers, with their many travels and exposure to stories from other clans, were perhaps the most culturally aware members of their society. The carvers had a great deal of freedom when it came to carving the figures on these poles, but they always followed formal stylistic rules. For example, ravens always had straight beaks, and eagles always had hooked curved beaks. Beavers had large, two large front teeth and held a stick in their paws and sat upright like this. Wolves and bears look surprisingly similar, but they could be distinguished by the length of their snouts and the shape of their teeth. Uh, there are lots of other details that could be communicated through various symbols, like this killer whale, for example, has multiple dorsal fins, which indicate that it's a supernatural figure. One of the great poles from the end of the Golden Age is this raven pole carved in 1896 for the chief in Wrangell, Alaska. This postcard uh, from 1913 shows how the totem pole looks standing outside the chief's house. The original pole lasted for a good 70 years. It collapsed in the 1970s, but you can still see a replica of the pole standing in Wrangell today. This pole tells the story of how Raven placed the sun in the sky. Raven is the great culture hero of Pacific Northwest legends. He's the second figure on the pole. Raven is a trickster figure, so he is shown in human and uh, Raven form here. He's also depicted with a sun around his face because of his role in this story. In the beginning, the world was covered in darkness. All the light in the world was hidden away by the creator in his box. The creator is the top figure on the pole, and he kept the light hidden from the world. In this, culture, or this tribe's tradition, the, raven, the creator is also a raven. You can tell by the straight beak. So Trickster Raven began scheming how he could steal the light from Creator Raven. He turned himself into a hemlock needle and floated down the stream, where the third figure on the pole, the daughter of Creator, Ra creator Raven, drank him up. Sometime later, she gave birth to a son, Trickster Raven, in disguise. He began to plead with his grandfather to let him play with the light in the box. He would throw tantrums and beg, and eventually Creator Raven gave in, took the light out of the box, and let Raven play with it. Well, he immediately turned back into his real form, flew up through the smoke hole in the house, and placed the light in the sky as the sun. The story of totem poles does not end with the Golden Age. In the 20th century, there was a decline in pole carving, 
some government attempts to recreate the art, and a revival of sorts in the 50s and 60s among native artists who could still learn from the old masters. But that story will have to wait for another day. If you're interested in learning more, you can visit randyhoyt.com ignite. I have some books and documentaries and other resources for you to check out. I hope that you'll all take a little bit more time studying these amazing poles and the wonderful narratives that they depict.